through the run through of rules and reminders? No. Okay, I'll do that real quick. All right, guys, reminders. Please direct your question to a player or coach individually. Call them out at the start of your question. Uh, if you want the, to ask a question, raise your hand. We'll get the microphone to you. We have one mic we're passing around, um, so we will pay attention to that. Please avoid questions that go down the line to everybody. If we have extra time, we'll let that happen. But for the time being, please direct it to one. Tyler, ESPN, you starting off? Oh, do I get the mic? Yes, you are. Here you go. Oh, great. I really just needed the mic. It makes me feel special. Hey, guys. Uh, Tyler from ESPN. Uh, this is for Wiggly. Uh, during, uh, before game five, going on stage, you seemed like really hyped up to get on there. Uh, what got, what were you guys saying, you know, in between game two and three when you guys made a comeback and how were you feeling, uh, going up on stage in game five? Like how did the, it feel to see the momentum shift through the series? <clears throat> uh, is this working? Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think that, um, we had a lot of like mental fortitude after game two, especially me, like. I felt like normally I would be kind of like upset or uh, like in a bad mood, but I think I, after the C9 series, I kind of learned that that's like never the way to deal with things and it'll just always affect your next performance. So I think going into the third game, I was like actually still confident in my team and myself. And I think I even said it, like I was like, guys, like we can still win this. So I, don't, I think everyone was like still in it mentally. So yeah. Uh, Joe Sloan, Checkpoint XP, uh, direct us to the coaches. Obviously, game two, pretty rough. Uh, what mental adjustments or what uh, team adjustments did you make coming out of game two to get prepared for game three and what allowed to have the, uh, the shift happen? Uh, oh, yeah. So I'll, I'll answer um, strate strategically, mentally. He can talk about the draft uh, or the strategy. So I think after the second game, like you get into the mindset where it's just a best of one. So you get everybody focused on just like the next, you know, 20, 30 minutes and also trying to play fearlessly um, because the biggest problem with momentum is that they're going to come in really fast and you're going to be really slow and afraid. So as long as you try to contradict both of those things, uh, you know, verbally with the players and everybody's on board with that, then uh, usually it's just a normal game, just like every other one. So I think that like uh, game three should be very predictable because they win at game one. So. Otherwise, they always try to do the same things at the blue side. So against that, how do we play? I think about during the game two because this game was seems to over. So I know our play style should be changed. So then I think uh, I realized how should we pick it. Then we just uh, try to avoid all the game fight. Then we just play well about macro. So that was working. Hey, uh, Nick Ray with Upcomer. This is a question for Power of Evil. Um, obviously, you're known to be more of like a mage player. So with that Ari pick in game five, I even saw you tweet that you hadn't really <laughs> practiced it. Uh, what were you thinking to just get the sudden confidence to just whip that out? Um, I think the Fury crafted like one or two days ago that like maybe Ari could be good against a uh, possible Tristana pick that they can pull off. Uh, I think during the series, I think game three, I think it was where we won. I said that Victor and like mages are not ideal like, in the series because the games are so fast, there's so many skirmishes, it's just like a bloodbath most games. So um, we still pulled out the Orianna because on red side it's possible on five pick. And in the last game, we are on the blue side where I need to blind pick. And mages are really bad to blind pick against, uh, I think, Huni and Damonte, who both play like somewhat assassins and like good combos. So I was just like, Let's just play Ari, let's just lane up all the time and try to get the better matchups. And I think um, the team was, uh, I think Trevor was giving me confidence as well that I should just pull it out if I believe it's the best pick. And obviously, I think it worked out great. And I'm really happy that I could just pull it out and <laughs> win it in game five and get it home. Nick Geraci and Ben Global, my question's for uh, Irene, actually. Uh, in all three games CL CLG was able to win in this series, uh, something important uh, was that Huni was not on a, a carry pick. He played Mages, Victor, and then Karma the last two games. Um, how important do you think the, the change in the top lane matchup and what Clutch Gaming was able to play in top lane, how important was that for the result of your reverse sweep? Uh, actually, I think about that, like, uh, this team really, really like to play around Huni. But when we're banning about his <coughs> good champion things, like maybe Lumber, and if we make it, 
this guy cannot play Tristana because of he don't know matchup or maybe they have already poor AD because of Kiana something. That should be good for us. So this guy, sorry. So Huni played the two times Karma. <laughs> so actually he cannot making playmaking. He's right. not playmaking. He's a kind of support. So that should be good for us. Yeah. So that's why we did. Chris Pilski, Jinx TV. Uh, my question is for Sticks A. Looking forward to the gauntlet, which team do you think is your biggest competition for that final spot at Worlds? Uh, I think our biggest competition for gauntlet is most likely going to be Clutch. Um, unless TSM can kind of like uh, come back and be a dominant team, I think it's just going to be us versus Clutch again. In the f or not in the finals, actually, because TSM's in the finals. In the semifinals. And then whoever wins that will just be versus TSM. And I think, like I said, if TSM does well, then... Maybe they'll be hard, but I'm not really expecting that. So probably just clutch. Hi, uh, Andrew Blanchard with uh, State Champs Esports. We, uh, I guess, this one's directed at either Walden or Irene. Uh, we saw a lot of lane swapping coming in in the last couple games, uh, where we would have Power of Evil and Ruin kind of swapping lanes. Was that a uh, active decision by the coaches pregame, uh, or was that a kind of like a play call uh, by one of the shot callers on the team? Uh, if you want to talk about that. So I think uh, we're doing a lot about desktop since to after leap to libraries because we scream with the EU then that mindset change us too. So we try to figure out just every time if we line swap, getting better matchup, how working, and also how do we object control with these things. So we are getting used to play this style. But maybe the other team can be unblessed about this situation. So that should be good for uh, our game. So we already prepared that scenario. Hey, it's Travis. Um, I This question, I actually don't know who to direct it to, the players or the coaches, but hopefully one person singularly can answer it. Uh, there's been some talk behind the scenes ahead of uh, Summer Split of Tafo over at CLG moving from a business role into more of like a role where he helps. He's cringing in the audience right now. Um, and I'm just kind of curious. It's been unclear to, I think to me at least, like what that role is and how much it's had an impact, but... Like a lot of the people that are searching for answers as to why CLG has done really well this split, some people are saying Tafo might have been a component of that. He seems to disagree, but if uh, if anybody wants to handle that. Um, Tafo does a lot for our team. He gives us TFT builds. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> uh, the, main, the main thing that uh, Tafo does is he gives us like analysis on like uh, where their wording patterns are or like just these analytics. And he gives us a lot of like stats. So our support staff is like included with like our coaching staff as well as like Tafo, and we have like primary who also gives like a lot of just level ones on top of like other regions and scouting that. And this is like helpful for the overall team. I just want to add like I think that the other bigger thing I guess he does is like sometimes like we'll have like draft discussions, and I think he's kind of like a outsider opinion that maybe didn't watch all of our scrims you know and like he'll just give us like oh this is what other regions are doing like maybe you want to consider that in your like draft overall draft uh plan so i think that's like the big one for me i think that it can be helpful and yeah like all those other things that uh, vincent just said so so and then also for the coaching staff um basically we'll work up uh, like some sort of meaning in the game where we'll say like, okay, well, if this kind of set of variables is in place, then maybe it means that this player is good or bad. And then we'll tell Tafo and have that discussion and he'll go away and he'll program an algorithm, pull all the data, um, and he'll just like run it through a model. And then we'll get a, you know, the next day or, or even a couple hours later, we'll get a model back and we'll be like, okay, well, is this predictive of what's happening? And then we can check it, uh, you know, within a day or two by looking at the results of our scrims or the results of a, a stage match and because he's able to handle that side of it as well we have this really nice loop where we can immediately get feedback on new ideas about what what could be good in the game an example of that would be scuttle control where we think oh maybe the fact that team liquid controls a lot of scuttles is something that makes them a good team or maybe it's useless so uh, then we can work up a formula that might predict that and then he can he can program it and get an answer for us um, that would guess the outcome of a weakest games based on what the scuttles look like, and then we just uh, see how accurate that is. Uh, 
Uh, Nick Butts with the Game House. Uh, this is for Biofrost. Um, you played more Thresh tonight than you have all split. Was that something you planned for this series or just kind of a spur of the moment thing? Um, I, I played like a decent amount of Thresh in my career, but I haven't really played it this season because I didn't think it was a good pick. But we were at like two, we're down zero two. I was like, you know what, screw it. We played a couple games of it in scrims and it worked out really, really well. And I'm pretty confident Thresh player. I used to be a one trick Thresh, so I can always just pull it out without like playing many games on it. And it's Weldon said, let's have fun. So I, th I thought, let's have fun, you know? <laughs> Hey, Tyler again. Uh, this is for Ruin. Uh, last split, uh, you were in Turkey. How would you compare the Turkish power level to the NA power level? And where do you think a team like Echo Fox, who finished last in NA, would finish in Turkey? <laughs> you could be honest. So I think like Turkish players and NA players, basic skill level is really different. Uh, let's say NA players like eight of ten Turkish players are like maybe like five six, you know. So and also big champion pool problems like in Turkey. So it's really different. And Echo Fox in Turkish league maybe I don't know maybe like second place. I don't know. <laughs> 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 Hey, Zane Bonsali, Cheddar Esports. This is for Weldon. Uh, we just heard Biofrost say that you said, you know, have some fun in game three. And I wanted to ask whether that has to do with being down 0-2 in this matchup, uh, if that's a typical, like, just have some fun when you're in a hole type thing, or whether the fact that this was just for seeding in the gauntlet, and we've already heard you think Clutch is really your only real opponent, played into that mentality as well. Uh, no, basically everything I say, the, po the point is to try to get to the victory. Uh, and um, I knew that the most important thing was to stay loose. Uh, you don't want to tighten up and be slower than the opposing team. And the best mentality for like playing fast and loose, uh, if you're if you feel like you're a worse team and you gotta make more plays, is to is to like have that like the you know more aggressive mindset about just having fun. Um, so I just thought it would keep them loose. Uh, Joe, a checkpoint. Uh, Stick, say I'm going to direct this at you, but if you know anyone can answer if they want to. Uh, last week against Cloud9, uh, you got down 0-2, took the third game, and then Cloud9 really kind of shut the door in the fourth game. This week, you take game three once again. W is there a difference in mindset? What was the difference between this week and last week? Were you able to complete the reverse sweep? Uh, I think we did. <clears throat> we did improve a bit. I think during the week, and we were like pretty, I guess, sad about the game four versus Cloud9, where we were, like. Damn, if we won that, we could have actually reverse swept them. Um, but overall, I just think Cloud9's a stronger team than Clutch, so we were able to take our lead from Game 4 and just snowball it well. Uh, when we had a Game 4 lead versus Cloud9, they were able to actually like stall it out and then end up beating us. I think it's just a big difference was uh, C9 was just the overall better team. Chris Bilski, Jinx TV. My question is for Weldon. From an outsider's perspective, it seems like you've really thrived this year. Um, or the split with CLG. Do you think that's something that's changed within yourself, or do you think it's something about the organization that's allowed this to happen? Uh, I think it's just been a slow build. Uh, the players have been working really hard. Um, they're kind of sick of losing, and they put in a lot of effort and really believed that it was going to pay off. So I think it's... Uh, somebody, somebody once told me um, this was... I'm forgetting his name right now. Um, anyway, somebody once told me that it's uh, always like 99% the players and 1% coaching uh, on the top, and I think that that's really true here. Like, uh, I think it's just the effort that they put in to decide to to be a winning squad. Nick Dracy, Men Global again. My question's for Weldon. Um, this this game, you know, obviously it's it was an important match for you guys in terms of third place and every everything else, but with you playing this team potentially again just a week later, does that affect how you prepare for this series and also what you take away from it, knowing that you're going to put them in the gauntlet just two weeks' time, probably? All right, sure. How do we consider uh, this series, since we've been clutched in 10 days, or 14 days? Uh, how do we consider about training? Yeah, training in this series. Uh, sorry, I didn't focus about that. Oh, that's okay. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, so 
Uh, I think we still have uh, some weakness. Actually, we saw the from the C9 game and also today also we are not perfect game. So I think we should try to figure out that. So how do we uh, play better at game one, two? Even last week also we did. We watching the whole split, whole series. Then we discussed each other about we all this time wrong things. We could have safety or we could have better team fight or something like that. So um, just to, yeah, I think match day learning point is most important for players because they very impressed for them. So we can learn in screen too, but that's why I really like to watching the our BOD games. So we will be back uh, before country. We will be much better. Andrew again, State Champs Esports. Uh, this one's for Wiggly. Um, so this is your first time playing on uh, such a big stage. Uh, at, you know, being third, four, third, fourth place match playing here at Detroit. Uh, what's been your experience like in Detroit? Have you been able to step out uh, and experience the area? And then what was it like playing on uh, such a stage like this? Uh, the first question, um, not really. I mean, there's not like a lot next to us that we can do really. And we just have scrims like all day leading up to the match. So it's just like... I just want to sleep after we're done screaming, <laughs> so I haven't had to do it. I haven't had time to do anything, um, but I think now we might have some time, so that'll be fun. And then uh, playing on the stage was honestly it was more fun than anything. I think even after the like first two games that went just like terribly from like my my own perspective and from everyone else. So uh, going into the, like just the whole series was just like fun to play, uh, win winning and losing. So. I think that's like the biggest difference for me was I just tried to have fun with it this time opposed to before where I feel like we were just all sad, but <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, Tim for uh, Oracle's Elixir. Uh, Wiggly, we've had uh, over the past several years, a lot of kind of young NA junglers step up, really kind of shine for a few splits and then, and then often kind of fall off a bit over the the coming seasons and and you know you're one of the the really young Indian junglers that's really popped up uh, especially this split and you know b being a top four MVP finisher and, and all of these things what are the things that you're looking at to do to make sure that you can sustain that success long term um well for me uh I think a lot of the reason why you see a lot of like really talented players that like come kind of come and go and like maybe don't stay a long time is because they they they're really good mechanically or they really have like a good like eye for like some crazy plays but a lot of the times they won't try to like learn the other parts of the game i'm not saying that's the case all the time but i think i've really tried to focus on learning the game itself um and i think irene has helped me a lot too like doing that and being able to like okay like this is what we need to play for this is how we need to control the map this is what we need to do this is how we want to engage and i think those things are like the things that like have junglers stick around for a long time like you know like medios like like smithy like these players have stuck like stuck around for so long because they know how to play the game not because they'll flash lisa and kick five people into your team so yeah <clears throat> For biofrost uh two of your or a couple of your former teammates are going head to head tomorrow uh do you have a prediction for that series um I think I'm going to go with 3-1 TL, even though C9 beat us and it was really close between TL and Clutch, I think that TL is the better team. And it would be really strange for TL to lose with four all pro like first people and it just feels wrong. <laughs> I don't know, but I think that TL will win. Uh, Travis stole my question, so I'm just gonna think of a new one really quick. Uh, Power of Evil. Uh, I've talked to uh, Jensen and Niski a bit before their final, and they've been kind of snapping back and forth, you know, trying to see who's better. From your perspective, as someone who's played both of them various times, who would you say is the better player mechanically, and who do you think is gonna win tomorrow? I think it's really hard uh, to say, like, sometimes, like, who is strong individually and who is stronger, like, mechanically, because I feel like they're really different in their playstyle. I think Niski is really unique in his playstyle. Every time we face him, it's uh, really hard since 
Uh, he just plays, I feel like, only melee mid laners. So, yeah. I think the only range player he played was like Veiga or something. He d never picked up the RZ, he never picked up the Corky, I think. So I think N Niski is really dangerous. He plays like pretty much, they play like one style, which is go through mid lane and play the Assassins, and that's why they're so dangerous. And I think Jensen is more, I would say like, he has more different styles. I think he plays the LeBlanc, he plays the Mages, he plays some of the Assassins. So I think it's just like they are like different, you know, and they both have strengths and weaknesses. And I think if you can punish the weaknesses from like either mid laner, um, that's how you how you beat them, right? So like if you can somehow get Niski on like a not melee mid laner, I feel like you will get a big advantage. And the other way around is like maybe for Jensen, if uh, he doesn't get like one of his like maybe like favorite picks, like there's a high chance as well that Niski will just beat him with a melee mid laner. Um, but I think I agree to uh, Byfrost that I think TL should be the better team and they should win three one or three two. I would actually say it's a little bit closer because I think Cloud9 is crazy and they always fight and they will not like uh, give up. So I think it's going to be free, free too. All right, this one's also for PoE. Uh, Robert Haynes from the Game House. Um, you played five different champions today, including bringing out the Diana. Can you walk us through that pick? Um, so Diana is supposedly the counter pick to Kiana. I think you can uh, all in a lot, you can win the side lane. I think Kiana can be better in team fights, so you need to like get a lead and you need to actually like use the Diana pick correctly in team fights and split push. So um that didn't really work out for us. <laughs> I think we we fall behind. Um I can't remember how, but I think we lost both silence, we lost mid lane pressure. So it's just like Diana is a champion and Kiana, they're like both really, really snowbally. And I feel like Kiana's somewhat like unskilled and I think Deanna is somewhat the same where it's just like whoever gets like two free kills just completely rolls over the other guy and it's like at one point Deanna, do Deanna doesn't need to win like hit skill shots anymore you just W ult protobol someone to death and for Kiana it's pretty much the same where you just EQ someone and you can't even miss the Q so it's I think a really really snowbally matchup and I think we fell behind so we just lost it and I think we just decided to like not like risk it again in uh, another game. Take the microphone from whoever has it. Uh, Christopher Hammond, Mike Thank you. Scooch together. Scooch together. Feel free to push the, the push the chairs back. You can push the chairs back. Push the chairs back. Let's move some water bottles out of the way or everybody shoot above. Thank you. Hey, thanks so much for watching the content that Brett and I have been putting out from Detroit. You know, trips like this are pretty expensive. We have to fly across the country. Uh, we have equipment, all this type of stuff. I, I just really thank Alienware so much for supporting that. I hope you do too. I know you've been watching these outros for almost a year now, but I hope it really does come down to you realizing that like this content wouldn't be possible without them. Uh, interestingly enough, Brett and I are also going to be flying to Seattle in just a couple days to be part of their PAX stuff around TFT. It's going to be happening at their booth. So if you are at PAX, come by and say hi to both of us. We'd love to see you. Uh, and I'm sure Alienware would too. And in just a short time, we're going to be creating uh, or putting out all the content that we made from China, also supported by them and Intel. And speaking of Intel, Alienware is going to be doing some cool stuff with them around Gamer Days in just a little bit. So stay tuned. Go check out their social channels. There's a bunch of cool stuff coming. Uh, thanks so much for watching this content. Love you much.